Okay, hello everyone. My name is Alistair. Um, I'm a long time .NET developer and I focus mainly on security. And today I want to talk to you about formal verification of smart contracts, C sharp smart contracts. Um, so I'm just going to do for a short bit just a basic overview of Stratus, the Stratus platform, and basic blockchain concepts. Then I'm going to do a little bit about static analysis of C sharp code. And then I'm going to do a bit about formal verification, just a bit the theory part of it. And the last one we can look at actually doing formal verification of C sharp smart contracts. Okay, so I want to talk about the Stratus platform. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about Stratus, but basically Stratus is a blockchain platform that supports smart contracts in C sharp. Um, right now, if you're doing smart contract development or blockchain development, uh, most likely you're using Ethereum or languages like Solidity and JavaScript. Um, it's kind of surprising that there aren't really that many options for doing smart contract development in .NET. So Stratus was designed basically to fill that gap. Um, because right now, blockchain development is becoming really, really important. And you know, many enterprises are looking to adopt blockchain technology. But given how popular .NET and, well, Java, but given how popular these languages are in the enterprise, uh, we really need a native c -sharp blockchain development platform. So that's what Stratus does. Okay, so I'll just go over um, just the basic blockchain concepts because, like I said, we're .NET developers and it hasn't really taken off, whatever reason, it hasn't really taken off among .NET developers. Okay, so a blockchain is just a kind of a ledger, basically, where you record transactions. But what makes it unique is that it's actually done in a decentralized manner. So you don't need a centralized server to control access or to coordinate. Uh, basically, in principle, anyone can spin up a blockchain node and they can start participating in the blockchain network. And their the protocols exist to ensure there's trust between the different nodes, even though they may be running, even though some nodes may be actually be hostile. Okay, so then the basic idea of a blockchain is that you have a chain of blocks where each block is dependent on the previous block. So each block stores a hash of the previous blocks and it writes that to its own header. So what that means is that you can't modify that blockchain. If you modify one block of it, the entire thing gets invalidated. So that's the mechanism that the blockchain basically preserves, basically blockchain preserves the integrity of the records. Okay, so, and so like I said, the unifying principle behind blockchain is decentralized trust, okay? Um, you can have blockchain nodes running all over the world running the same software, and they all coordinate and have consensus, and they maintain a, a reliable uh, tra ledger of transactions. Okay, and you have these consensus protocols, basically, uh, that do the things. So you've probably heard of proof of work, proof of stake, and all these, basically all, all these consensus protocols, they, they allow the blockchain to record this transaction data in a decentralized way, without having to have any sort of like centralized control. Okay, and there is economic incentive basically for people to cooperate. So it actually works, like basically, if you decide, you I mean, you can decide, say you want to be hostile to attack the blockchain network, like one node, but that's actually more economically sensible for you to cooperate with the other blockchain nodes, right? So that, that's really, and so when blockchain took off with Bitcoin, that was really a, a key innovation. Um, there's a problem called the Byzantine General's problem that, that block basically Bitcoin attempted to solve. Okay, so just looking at just some of the looking at the implementation of the components of a blockchain, uh, basically it's a you just have a peer-to-peer -peer network that's basically communicating by this, uh, this gossip protocol. You have messages being sent as transactions. Uh, you have consensus rules. You have a state machine basically that processes the different transactions, and of course you have the actual blockchain that actually that actually records or that the journal of the transactions, and you have this algorithm that coordinates its control over the blockchain in a decentralized way. So that's, that's, basically, that's basically what a, a blockchain is. And I mean, it's something that's becoming very important right now. So like I said, Stratus is a blockchain platform implemented in pure C sharp. Okay, uh, right now blockchains like Bitcoin, they mostly like C++ or C or Rust, but Stratus is actually pure C sharp and it's all open source. Okay, and Stratus basically, and the way it's designed, you can basically use how much of the platform you actually need. You can plug in different components to the platform and just basically use whatever you need to customize whatever you need. It's really targeted towards enterprises who need to do blockchain development. Okay, um, it's based on N Bitcoin. Uh, that's an implementation of the Bitcoin protocols in C Sharp. It's a full implementation. And I mean, if you have a, if you have an enterprise, uh, you would use like a blockchain. I mean, instead of having like say like a central server, if you have to coordinate with like a, another person, another party. 
So your transactions basically on a blockchain, they're verifiable, they're transparent, they're immutable, they're cost efficient, they're cross-border, decentralized, and fast. So that's the reason that basically more and more enterprises today are turning towards blockchain technology to solve different problems. And Tratus was basically designed basically to fill that need for a .NET blockchain platform. And the thing about smart contract that Tratus also does is it provides a smart contract platform by using .NET as a virtual machine. Okay, so what exactly is a smart contract? Well, the first generation of blockchains like Bitcoin, they were designed just to record simple transaction cryptocurrency. Just like you have a ledger, okay, so you buy Bitcoin, you sell Bitcoin, you transfer Bitcoin to someone, you receive it. That's what it was designed to do. So uh, later blockchains like Ethereum, they generalized this basically. They said, okay, so instead of just recording transactions, what if you record just changes to data structures? And in that way, basically, you would create what, like, sort of like what the creator called a world computer, where you could basically have like this arbitrary computation on data, but still using the, the blockchain. Okay, so, so what that was smart? So basically, all smart contracts are their computer code, then that manipulate structures on the blockchain. Okay, so people, when people talk about smart smart contracts, I mean, usually it's like it's sort of like a, a misnomer because they're not very smart one, and they're not legally binding too. So. But I mean, uh, you can't say that, you know, that dumb computer code is going to, you know, change finance forever. It doesn't have that same ring to it. So I guess we're stuck with the smart contract name. Okay, so, so what the smart so basically is just computer code running on the blockchain, and they coordinate these complex transfers. So you can able to type of apps like, well, tokens, decentralized finance, you know, all the things that, that, that are in the news right now, basically, they're all implemented inside smart contracts. Okay, so a smart contract executes on a virtual machine. So you probably heard of the EVM for e Ethereum, right? So um, that basically, that's, that's basically, the, it's a virtual machine that all the blockchain nodes run, and your Ethereum smart contracts execute on that blockchain node. Okay, and the smart contract, well, and the smart contract, it's not like general purpose computer code. Um, it has to be, it has to have certain properties because of the decentralized nature, it has to be deterministic. If you run code on one block node with the same prompt, with the same input, you must get the exact same results. So that's the thing. So even though you might use like a two incomplete language, there are like restrictions of what you can do in your smart contracts. Okay, so, and so basically, so before smart contract, you just have basically like Bitcoin, which is like basically cryptocurrency, that's basically money. But now with smart contracts, you can have, you know, decentralized organizations, you can have tokens. I mean, it's, it's opened up a whole new, a whole huge and powerful range of, of, of programs you can run on the blockchain. And that's why smart contract development today is really, really important. Okay, so this is just an, an example of, of a smart contract. Um, you can see it, it's very similar to what a regular, like regular C sharp or regular Java program, but this basically, this basically runs on the blockchain. Uh, it doesn't run on a, on a local computer. Um, and, so, and so basically, so these, these data structures and, and classes, they sort of coordinate transferring value from one party to the next. So when you have to sell your tokens or your NFTs or things like that, have a mortgage, have a vote. In this case, this is the code that you run to actually do these things. Okay, so what the Stratus platform does is it provides a virtual machine for smart contracts based on the .NET CLR. Now, that's a really, inter that's a really interesting choice because typically, for Ethereum, for instance, and I mean most other smart contract platforms, uh, what they do is they actually create their own custom virtual machine. But what Stratus did is it basically it chose to use the .NET CLR as the VM. And I mean, there are a lot of different things you can say about that, but I mean, from a, from a security point of view, it's really interesting because the thing is when you, Ethereum is when you're like about, well, say eight, 14, say 14 years old, and I mean, .NET has been in existence for a very long time. So people have been attacking .NET, attacking, trying to break it for a very long time. So there's a huge amount of knowledge about uh, the .NET CLR and what languages like C Sharp. There are a huge amount of static analysis tools as well. So that's the advantage of using the .NET CLR for your smart contract VM has over Ethereum and you know, other virtual machines. So, well, and of course, well, you know, if you have a .NET assembly as a smart contract, then you know, it has to be analyzed before you actually, because like I say, it has to have certain properties. It can't be non-deterministic, it can't be non-bounded. So you must actually analyze your contract before you actually upload it to a blockchain node. Okay, so um, we'll just, you guys look at basically what uh, a con example contract, this is a standard token contract. So you know, a token basically is sort of like, okay, you have well, Dogecoin, I mean, you probably heard about that one. And you know, what tokens basically, I mean, it's just really just a way to exchange value on top of an existing 
cryptocurrency. And the way that's actually implemented is just basically all you have is a ledger that records, okay, so-and-so address got so-and-so tokens transferred to it. I mean, that's really all that, that's really all that, it's actually, compared to what, compared to how it's talked about, it's actually really simple. And it kind of begs the question, well, I mean, what, what exactly, when you own, when you say you own a token, you know, what, what is it you actually own? All right, so, I mean, but that, that's, a, that's a talk for another day. Um, so this is basically, this is a smart contract code in C Sharp. So I can see it's just regular C Sharp. So, you know, if you're a, a C Sharp developer, uh, this would actually be a lot more familiar to you than having to learn like an another language like Ethereum. So, so just to give you a, a look at what we're going to be talking about, um, so using the tool called Silver, we can actually verify that smart contract. Okay, so when I run this inside, when I run this, basically the smart the Silver verifier. It does a lot of transformations on the source code, and it spits back out verification of different properties. Okay, so each method in the smart contract gets analyzed, and the silver tool will actually tell you, okay, well, if there's a problem with a particular, if a particular method, it will actually flag it. Okay, so we look at how, we look at how this gets, gets done in the next slide. Okay, so talking about from a security point of view, so, you know, smart contracts, they're, they're prone to a lot of different vulnerabilities. I mean, nearly every day you probably hear about, you know, this smart contract got hacked, uh, so-and-so lost millions of dollars and things like that. And I mean, you know, it's really, if you think about like critical code, even though the code is relatively simple, if you make a mistake in a smart contract, it could cost you basically, you know, it can cost you your entire business. Um, either you make a, a mistake and people lose whatever they invest in, or a hacker hacks you and they deliberately transfer, you know, whatever from your smart contract. So when you're writing smart contract code, it, that's, I mean, it's security is like really, really critical. Okay, and, but the thing about this is that if you're a .NET developer and you want to do smart, con you want to do smart contract development and you have to use a language you're not familiar with, well, obviously, you know, it's far easier to write secure code, code that follows best practices if you're using a language that you're familiar with. Um, so, you know, for a .NET developer, if you want to get into smart contract development, but you have means you have to learn a, a new language. And that's, that's really kind of problematic because, you know, the chances are very high you're going to make a mistake. You're not going to be writing, you know, at least not initially, you're not going to be writing really secure code. So basically a lot of static analysis and formal verification tools have been developed to help developers basically find these vulnerabilities inside smart contract code. Okay, so there are, I mean, there are lots of different, for mostly for Ethereum, uh, and other different smart contract security tools. So the tool has been, so this tool is called Silver. And Silver is a static analyzer and a formal verifier for Stratus C Sharp smart contracts. Okay, so let me talk about static. So basically, static analysis, it's where you look at the properties of a program without actually executing them. So normally, uh, when you test, like when you, write tests for programs, like a unit test, or you do things like, for, you're actually executing the code to see what happens. So all that psych analysis asks is like, let's look at the source code. What can we actually derive from the just looking at the source code? And there are a lot of things that actually smart that psych can actually do that actually, you know, they actually literally prove certain things, the code has certain properties. Okay, so, um, you know, and so things like software metrics. So we all know these different, we have like these different metrics, like, okay, how many classes you have, well, how many classes do you have in your assembly? Um, how long is it? How long is a typical class? Um, how many methods do you have? Do you use fields instead of properties? So all those things basically. So when you look at those things, you're basically doing static analysis, and it can basically give you metrics on what your code does. Okay, and that's why most of these, um, you know, code quality tools they use static analysis to be able to tell you these things. Okay, so there are a lot of different properties you can actually just looking at the source code you can actually derive from without actually having to run the code because you can't you cannot test. You know, you can't basically test every bug, potential bug. Okay, it basically, so testing, it tells you that bugs, that it doesn't tell you that there aren't any bugs. Okay, so Silver, so basically, it's, it's, it's written in C Sharp. Uh, it's an analyzer for Stratus smart contracts. And what Silver does, it analyzes the code both at the bytecode level, at the .NET CIL level, and also at the C Sharp language level. Okay, um, so Silver has different interfaces. Uh, you can run on the CLI. Okay, so this is a silver on the CLI. So um, this is suitable for like if you're doing, and we can actually run without the colors and stuff like that. So if you're like in a build pipeline, you can run silver like that. 
um, you know, as part of a CI pipeline. Uh, you can write inside Jupyter Notebook, like what I'm going to be doing now, right inside just for demonstration and reporting. And if you're a developer, well, most likely you'll be using Silver inside Visual Studio. Okay, and so in terms of just static analysis, um, it does use different syntactic semantic analysis, call graph analysis, control flow, data flow, these different kinds of static analysis. And it also does formal verification of C sharp using spec sharp. So we'll see, uh, we'll see formal verification in a little while. Okay, um, so well, yeah, so basically, so the source code analysis part of Silver uses um, Roslyn. So you probably find that Roslyn basically is, is the official compiler API for C Sharp. And Roslyn exposes basically anything the compiler can do, it exposes that, those functions to the user. Okay, so um, probably we can look at, at how, so if you guys look at how Roslyn is used inside Silver, so this is a, this is a simple smart contract. Now, like I said, there are a lot of restrictions about the kind of code you can actually use inside a smart contract. So, and what Silver does basically, basically does the analysis, and it would flag anytime you try to use any sort of illegal code inside a smart contract, it will tell you. So, if I try to import, for example, like the system of collections namespace, well, that brings an error, basically. You know, you can't actually, there are a lot of restrictions on what you can do inside a smart contract code, and using members from that particular, that particular namespace is not allowed. So, this will flag an error, you know, it will flag that using that, that, that namespace will flag it as an error inside Visual Studio. And there are a lot of different basic rules that, that Silver has to implement. So, okay, you're not allowed to create new objects on the heap because that actually, because, you know, if you create a new object and let's say the node runs out of memory, that's a non-deterministic non problem because then, you know, so basically you're not allowed to, any sort of, uh, any sort of data structure that will use like a, a dynamic amount of memory, you aren't allowed to create that. So if I try to create a dictionary inside a smart contract, Okay, so what will flag this? Say, okay, well, look, you know, this, this particular contract is not allowed here. Okay, so this is an example of, 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 of Roslyn analyzer. So if I try to declare a field, it says basically, okay, well, again, you, can, you, you can't actually use fields, you can't actually use public fields inside smart contracts. Okay, so basically, so that's how, how Silver uses Roslyn uh, to do this kind of static analysis of smart contract code. Okay, so we can look at uh, the bytecode analysis part of the static analysis. So when you do, when you actually do bytecode analysis, um, you're looking at the actual assembly, the bytecode in the assembly. So you don't actually need the source code to be able to do the analysis. And many times, actually, there are a lot of things that are actually simple to do just looking at the .NET bytecode and looking at the C-sharp, because C-sharp is a very complex language. So many times, if we simply just compile that to CIL and then analyze the CIL, you actually can actually do a lot of things better than you were just looking at the source code. So these different types of analysis, you know, you have call graph analysis, class hierarchy, control flow, data flow, different types of analysis. And um, so basically what, what Silver does, it, it converts that particular CIL into a tree address code for analysis. Okay, so this is uh, an example. So we're running Silver. Um, so I have a smart contract here at this particular, this particular URL at GitHub. This is, is it was being sent as a pull request. Okay, I think that crashed. Okay, but basically, but basically, you can basically run this inside Silver, and you can run it. Um, basically, you can analyze, pull it from GitHub, and analyze that particular assembly. Okay, and so from that particular assembly, you can get, you know, like a call graph. So this is a, a call graph of those methods in the assembly. Okay, so, so basically you can just see the, the different nodes, and it basically the, the call graph will basically tell you, okay, what nodes are calling what, and which nodes are basically, which nodes are basically linked. So this is a type of static analysis you can actually do inside Silver. And all this here, are you deriving this from the, the bytecode? Okay, and again, well, another thing is the control flow graph. So again, you can basically run, run this, and it will basically give you a list of all the basic blocks in your code. You get like, you get like a, a list of, so you can see like where the different decision, the different decision statements are. And so these are the different types of things you can actually do in Silver. So all these are actually useful. If you're, look, if you're analyzing a smart contract for vulnerabilities, so information like this is actually pretty useful. Okay, so 
So, yeah, so we, we saw, you know, we, we looked at the source code analysis part of Silver and how we could use like Silver as using as a ROS analyzer inside Visual Studio. Okay, and um, so there are things that 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 Silver uses ROS for. So we'll see it in a little later on. But basically, that ROS is a really powerful compiler API. Let's just do a lot of different things, static analysis, um, you know, either inside Visual Studio or on, on the command line. Okay, so. Probably we could talk about formal verification now. Just a brief intro into formal verification. So we saw that the previous type of analysis, we were looking just for certain properties of a program, you know, where the decision statements are, what calls are being made, what procedures are being called. But there are certain questions we want to ask that require a lot deeper type of analysis where you actually have to, to reason about the program code. Okay, so things like, okay, a function returns a certain value, always returns a certain value, or a prompt is always passed with a certain value. Um, an array is accessed within bounds, or you know, a function returns a way that that's, is assorted. So the thing is, it's actually possible to prove that you know these things. Just looking at the source code, you can actually prove that that these things will, will always happen. Okay, so if we look at this this C sharp program, um, basically we're saying okay. If we look at this program, can we say that this program always returns true? Always return, will always return true, it never returns false. Okay, and so if we just look at if we just look at the code, um, we can say, yeah, we can give like a, an informal argument. We can say, yes, okay, look. Um, the condition says if i is more than 15. But we know that i is never gonna be more than 15 because i is less the loop variable is always less than 10. So this will always control will always fall to here. So that's an informal argument. We can say, okay, yes, we know that this method will always return false. Just looking at the source code. Okay, so if we have that, we have an uh, informal argument like that. So how do we formalize that argument? So normally, when, when we formalize, you know, reason, we want to say, okay, what exactly? What are the things we're talking about? So inside the program, well, we have variables, and we know these variables can take certain values. So if we take about the state of a program at any given time, the state is basically just a map of the values to the program variables. Uh, that, that, that's all a state is. And as the program executes, it transitions between different states. Okay, so and that's, a, that's an abstraction of how a program executes. So that, that's, uh, that's, and that's actually pretty precise and definite. So we can actually use that as, and we can, if we're going to reason about program, we can actually use the, the program state. And we can say, okay, uh, different sets of the program states, they actually characterize in a very specific way the program's behavior. Okay, so if we were to make these logical statements about the program about the, the program states, that would allow us basically to reason in a definite way about how the program behaves. Okay, um, so we, so we have we have we can look we can we can just look at a, a, a function and see okay and tell certain things. Well, how do we actually prove statements about that? Well, basically, we have to use a logic. We have to use a formal logic, basically, to, to prove that, that these things will happen. Okay, so uh, what, how we go about in formal verification is that, well, first of all, we annotate the different, we annotate source code with, with different, uh, making different statements. Okay, so this particular annotation says, for all i, i is more than 15. Okay, and that, that statement is true because, uh, basically, so when the, stu when the control gets, when i gets to here, we know that i is more than 15. So that's a, a logical statement about, about the, the, the program code. Okay, so we have, a, so things like assertions, so you're probably familiar with assertions, um, and when you're doing unit tests, you say, okay, you know, assert that this particular property has a certain value, or it's not null. So assertions, um, function precondition, those are, those are assertions that say, okay, before the function executes, then the parameters being passed are going to be a certain way. And similarly, post conditions, um, after the function executes, the return value of the function is going to be a certain value. And uh, then you also have things like loop, where it says inside the loop, uh, this condition always holds. So all those kinds of statements are annotations. Okay, so if you consider an entire set of these annotations for a program, um, that's called the specification for the program. And if you have a specification for a program, it's a very precise way to define how the program behaves. And that is how we can actually use formal verification to show that whether the program satisfies the specification or not.
Okay, so this is a specification that's so it's, it's a very precise statement of how the program behaves using formal logic. Okay, and just so basically the main type of logic we talk about with formal verification is whole logic. So basically for logic is just, just a logic for reason about how the program behaves given the program specification. And the main notation is, is just simple. It's you have a pre you have a precondition, you have a program statement and a post condition. Okay, and I mean that's just and just that's just basically that's just like the basic notation that all these formal verifiers rely on. Okay, so what the formal verifier would do is it would take the annotations and it would take the source code and transform that into something called verification conditions. And basically you can show that if you prove that's an, an, the verification, they're just pure logic formulas. If you can prove that the verification conditions, if they're, they're valid, that means that the program annotations uh, match the program behavior. It means that the pro your specification is actually correct. Uh, if it's not valid, it means either, either your annotations are, are wrong or something is wrong with your code. And most of the time, you know, we think that something is wrong with the code. That's why it actually we can't prove these verification conditions. Okay, so um, so basically that's that's how we that's basically what the whole core idea of formal verification is. We want to prove statements about programs by deriving these verification instruments from the program code and the specification and running that through a verifier. And the verifier can tell us if it is that these verification conditions hold and the, the specification is correct. If it doesn't hold, then it means that, that something is wrong with, with, with our code. Okay, so this is just an example. Basically, when you run, uh, so this side, we had a, a simple program. We had a, a simple program, uh, like we said, where we said, okay, can we reset this function will always return false? Okay, and so in this case, if we verify this, uh, we, we have, uh, we make an annotation here, and this says that, um, if we, we, what we're saying is that the function A is always going to return false, right? That's a specification. Okay, and if we, if we run that through the verifier, So if we run that through the verifier, um, what we would see is that basically the verifier would take the, that particular, that specification we did, I'll combine it with the source code, and would tell us, okay, so, you know, it would tell us, okay, whether or not the, that actual method actually verified. So we can just look at the, the results here. Okay, so we could see at this, this particular case, the method actually verified, right? So now, what if I were to change parts of the program? Okay, so let's say I change this. Let's say I change this to five. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you got it. Yeah, thanks a lot, yeah, you're right, actually. Okay. Okay, so this is going to, so this is basically, so we know that this is actually, is always going to be too much. So let's say I increase this to 25. Okay, so we see basically, so because I changed the code, it means that now the program code does not actually match the specification. So the verifier flags us. Okay, so we, see we, so we have this method here that says that that particular method, it failed verification. Okay, the, that post condition is gonna be satisfied because we changed the code. So, I mean, and that, that is basically procedure, that's basically all that for, for verification is. Um, basically, you, if it is that, that you have a, basically a specification, a set of specifications, and you can basically ju just annotate your source code with these specifications. So here's a better example. Okay, this is a, a max function. Okay, and um, so the max function, this has actually more annotations inside the function. We have, again, we have these preconditions, and we also have a loop invariant inside the loop. Okay, so I can run this. 
Okay, and so and this also succeeds. But let's say I change let's say I change this. Uh, let's say I change this. Okay, so this is supposed to so this particular function, so this specification here says that this particular function it's supposed to it's basically it's supposed to return the maximum value. It's supposed to return the maximum value. Yeah, it's supposed to return the maximum value. Um, what if I change the code so it actually, so basically the algorithm for maximum is actually wrong. So when I try to verify this. Okay, so again, so again, basically, so that particular method is gonna fail verification because the code no longer matches the specification. Okay, that, that there's no guarantee that this particular method is gonna return the, va because gonna return the maximum value. Okay. So, um, so basically, so that's really how we do uh, formal verification, you know. Okay, and well, we can just talk about quickly. So, of, like, you know, so we've seen basically what formal verification is. Um, how do we like integrate? How do we integrate statements? And, and so, how do we integrate statements, uh, specifications into programs? Well, there are a couple options. We can use an entirely new language. We can use a separate language, or we can extend an existing language. Okay, and there are different so. Right now, formal verification, you know, it's actually used in many safety critical systems like microprocessor design, uh, device drivers. Um, it has been shown that you can actually make an entire operating system formally verifiable. So there are many tools right now for formal verification for languages like C, Java. Uh, okay, so formal verification is a very mature technology right now. So we can just quickly take a look at how we can actually use formal verification inside smart contracts. Okay, and so smart contract code, in contrast like general purpose code, smart contract code is actually very amenable to formal verification. So as we saw, the code has to be deterministic. Um, we, are, we have a guarantee that smart contract code will always terminate because you have, you only have finite gas, you can only execute for so long. So that's one major thing hurdle we remove. We, we always know that program is going to terminate. And right now, it, it's an in industry, in industry right now where companies that they audit smart contracts um, basically, that, that's a very big industry right now. We're using formal verification to audit smart contracts, look for vulnerabilities. And there are also a lot of open source tools that we can use for formal verification. Okay, so just a couple of them, just uh, Solacy Verify, that's actually an extension to the, the Solidity compiler. ACT is a specification language for Ethereum. Okay, so we're gonna look at SpecShop. Now, SpecShop was created by Microsoft Research, basically. It was designed to be a, a programming system to incorporate formal verification. Okay, and so and there are a lot of different design goals that, that SpecShop had to sort of eliminate the, the drawbacks from the, the previous ways that, that of doing formal verification. Okay, so and how so basically what how what SpecShop does is so we saw when we were doing it, when we were actually doing the formal verification, um, we actually just added like these annotations to the C sharp smart code. And what happened is the verifier took those annotations, took the smart code, it transformed it into another language called Boogie, and then it ran that through the verifier and was able to actually verify that code. Okay, um, so I can just talk, I just talk about basically uh, SpecShop. Um, SpecShop was actually a pretty old technology. I mean, well, relatively speaking, you know, it was written, it was originally targeted C Sharp 2.0. That was like, you know, like decades ago. So to get SpecShop to run on modern computers, we had to make some changes. Okay, so we wanted SpecShop to support all the newest, latest versions of, of C Sharp. We also wanted this, if, we have, if you have SpecShop code, it should also work with any C Sharp compiler. Um, you can write from different, well, interfaces like Visual Studio, Jupyter, and also to integrate inside Visual Studio as a Rosin analyzer. <laughs> so how we did is we use Rosin syntax rewriters, basically. What we would do is, so let's say we have some new C Sharp syntax. Like we have, for, so now we have in C Sharp expression bodied functions. We have string interpolation, but these things aren't supported by older versions of C Sharp. So we can actually use Roslyn to rewrite that code to basically the older equivalent. So we can see here for this particular. So we basically, when we, we rewrite, when we actually, um, we, when we're doing the, the rewrite, and so basically w everything gets printed out when the program is actually being compiled. Okay, so if you have, say, an expression bodied function like this, this actually gets transformed into this. Basically, you just have a return statement instead of the expression, instead of that particular operator. 
and string interpolation gets, gets transformed into string that format. Okay, so, and so how we maintain compatibility with C sharp, we basically we embed the annotations as comments. So if you run the, the C sharp code through a compiler, the compiler would not see the annotations. Only when you run through the spec sharp compiler, that's when, the, that's when it's actually gonna pick up those annotations. Okay, and so when you pass, so when you pass uh, that C sharp code through, the, through Silver, it rewrites, basically does all this rewriting to get a valid spec sharp program, and then it sends that to the spec sharp verifier. Okay, so that, that's what's getting this the verifier pipeline. Uh, we just we have the annotations, we uncomment them, we rewrite the newer C sharp code to a, a version of C sharp code that spec sharp supports. We pass it to spec sharp, spec sharp translate that into CIL and runs boogie on that, and that's the entire verifier pipeline. Okay, so we look at so here is a, a sm here's a, a smart contract. A really simple smart contract, it just does multiplication of two values. But you see that it has different, so all these annotations, so we don't, we don't actually need these, I'm just showing this just to show what spec sharp can do. So we have these annotations here. Okay, so, and so when we run, when we run this through, through silver, it would rewrite the code, rewrite the annotations. Okay, it would compile the code and basically spit back out the results telling us, okay, this particular, this particular method is valid or invalid and telling us the problem is that it actually detected for that method. Okay, so that's, a basic, that's basically how what, what Silver does. So we can just look at how Silver looks for smart contract vulnerabilities. Okay, so one really common problem is where you have a call and you don't actually check, you make a, a transfer call, say, but you don't actually check where the return value is. And that, that's something that, that, I mean, as new developers, we all, we all basically do this. Um, you know, we just fire a function and we forget what, whatever the result is. But that, that, of course, if you're in a smart contract, that can have really you know, profound effects on, on what you're doing. So let's say we have this donate contract. Okay, so um, this is just a really, really simple uh, contract. Basically, whatever, uh, whatever you send, whatever money you send, whatever cryptocurrency you send to it, it basically just sends that to whoever owns the contract. Of course, we don't. This we just could have just send it there, everybody. I just want to see basically how the smart contract verification looks. So, if we have this really, really simple smart contract. Okay, so I'm gonna verify this. So what I can say is, so what I can say, so I don't have a specification here. So okay, let me put this specification says, okay, I want to say that when I transfer the money from that's being sent to me, that the balance of the owner has increased by a particular amount. Okay, so I want to say, so, so that's basically, that's, I'm putting that annotation uh, inside the donate method. Now, if I try to verify this, what's gonna happen? Okay, so Silver compiles it. And verify it. So you see that, that the, that's, method actually fails because this keeps telling us that. So that donate method, um, it doesn't actually, that assertion doesn't hold, okay? Uh, that assertion that, we wrote, that actually doesn't hold. The reason is that that particular transfer method, it actually returns a value. It could be basically, if it succeeds, it actually returns a different value. So what we've written here, there's no guarantee that what we have done here with actually the actual currency will actually get transferred to the particular person, right? So what we have to do here is we have to say, okay, so we know that the transfer is actually turning a transfer result. And what we can say here is that, so what we can say is that 
the, it's only when the transfer succeeds that the balance of the owner will increase with whatever was centered. Okay, this is the implication operator. So with this new contract now, we can try verifying this again. Okay, so now we see, okay, so now it verifies. Because the verifier was able to prove that the code we've written matches our specification, that, that the balance of the owner will always increase. Okay, so that's one way that we can use, and of course, so we could, if, we were doing, if we were doing this traditionally, we would use the unit test and say, okay, um, we would basically mock up, mock up uh, have like a, a, a value. So we would say, okay, if what happens when I trans result is false, um, you know, so we, we can mock those values, but the thing about it is that, you know, we, we have to do that basically for every method. We have to try and think on, you know, what sort of bugs would occur in our program. But formal verification, basically, as long as the code doesn't match specification, it's going to be flagged. Okay, so, and that's, so that's really the power of static analysis. Um, you don't have to consider, you don't have to consider basically every particular condition that, that, that you know, you could think of where an error will happen or a bug would occur. Um, once your code doesn't match specification, then the, for the verifier will actually tell you, okay, this you have to look at your code. Something is wrong inside your code. So that's how formal verification can complement um, different ways of testing, like unit testing and fuzzing. Okay, so another thing we can look, just look at briefly is re-entry attacks. Um, basically, and this is a really, really famous type of vulnerability in smart contracts. It's one of the actually first vulnerabilities, attacks on Ethereum. And a, a re-entry attack actually caused Ethereum, basically that, that was what caused Ethereum to fork, um, you know. So these, these types of vulnerabilities are actually very, very common. So um, how we can mitigate this is that, so this is a, a standard token contract. Um, what happens that, so what Stratus does is, Stratus exposes this API function where you can say, you can actually tell if a particular address is actually another smart contract. And you, can act, and you can basically say, okay, no, I don't want to send, I don't want to deal with this if the, that particular address is a smart contract. Okay, so this is a, a, this is a, a token, this is a, a token contract. Okay, we have a method here called transfer from, and we have transfer to. Okay, so what I wanna do is, so I want to, let's say I write a precondition So I'm putting this annotation, and, and you can see that this, the annotation is it's just C sharp code. You don't have to learn all the syntax. It's just basically plain C sharp code, more or less. Okay. Sorry. Oh yeah. Thank you again. <laughs> it's the second time you've seen me. Yes. So okay. So I can write in this this particular this function precondition. Okay. So let's annotate this and see. Let's verify this and see what happens. Okay, I think we still have a syn we have a syntax error. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So this is kind of kind of tricky because when you put in when you write a function precondition, it actually goes below the function declaration, but before the actual curly brackets. So that's one kind of strange thing. So basically, that's where the require statement goes. Okay. Okay, so this was able to compile, and so we can see that with that annotation. Okay, so you can see that in any so any function any function that we have an annotation is going to fail because there's no way for the verifier to prove that we're actually that particular call is being made to an address that isn't a smart contract. So what we would have to do is we would have to go into our code, and we would have to basically put checks into our code to check to see that, that you know, the address that, that we're dealing with is in a smart contract code. And, in, you know, and 
So once we've put, what we've put those checks in, we, will, we run the verifier again, and the verifier would be able to tell us, okay, if it can prove that that particular method is never called with an address that is uh, another smart contract, then yeah, basically that, that, that the contract will actually validate. And so all this is being done statically. Um, it's not being done, you're not using unit tests basically to run and see, okay, what happens if I pass you know, a smart contract? Okay, it's all being done by just looking at the, particular, at the source code. Okay, um, yeah, so, and so basically, so that, that's basically just a brief overview of form of verification of, of c -sharp smart contracts. Um, I'll, I'll post up the, the links to the repository and test trials online, so um, if, you have any if you have any questions, uh, I can take it now, or you can just get me on social media. Okay, so thanks, thanks very much. <laughs>